We are living in a computer programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant, and I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off. Good morning and welcome to another edition of the Monday Mashup. I am your host, Robert Phoenix, and there are 314 days remaining until the end of the year. Actually, 315, since it's a leap year. Today is the 51st day of the year in the Gregorian calendar. So I was thinking about doing my show in a uh, as a kind of an NPR NPR mode today. You know, the whole NPR kind of inflection thing going on. It goes something like this. Good morning and welcome to the February 20th edition of the Monday Mashup. I'm your host, Robert Phoenix. Today is the 51st day of the year. There are 315 days left since it is a leap year. Looking back into history, today we'll find that it is the inaugural day or the first day of the Postal Service Act, which took place in 1792, and established the post office, or the United States Post Office Department, signed into effect by President George Washington. Also on this day, in 1872, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City opened Later on in today's show, we'll be hearing from Garrison Keeler. I don't think that's me, is it? <clears throat> I don't think so. I'm still waking up, even though I've been up for about an hour. Actually, a little more than an hour. I think I got up today at about 8 o'clock. Yeah. I had uh, I, think, I think I clocked uh, seven and a half hours worth of sleep last night, which I needed. I was pretty pretty tired. I worked hard for a Sunday. I put up a new post on the site, did a lot of inner work, spent time with my kid. I've been getting into genealogy lately, and it's through my son's uh, school project. And it's been kind of interesting. I've been finding out more about the genealogical arc coming from my mother's side. And uh, the whole idea here is my kid has a school project, and he has to find sort of the oldest, the first relative that he can kind of pick up on the radar. And this happens on my mother's side, and it's in 1690. And there's a guy who who left uh, Holstein, Germany with his brother. And they they sailed to New Amsterdam, arriving in 1639. And they wound up living in Long Island. So I found out a fair amount about this guy. It was kind of interesting. His name was Hans Janssen, and they're from uh, 
Nordstrand, which is the North Strand or the North Land. And so the, they eventually became the Van Nostrands. They dropped the Janssen and all that part. So it's, it's kind of interesting, actually. And I, I found a book. It's pretty cool. I found a book that was written in 1903, and it has to do with the congregation of the Dutch families of Long Island <clears throat> from the 1600s up into the early 1800s. And essentially what it is, it's kind of a, <clears throat> excuse me, like an almanac of births and deaths and wills and marriages. And it goes family by family by family. And I actually found the uh, the will, last will and testament of my grandfather 13 generations back online. It was kind of cool. And what he left his sons and all that stuff. So I'm time traveling in a in a kind of kind of interesting way. It's amazing. <clears throat> it's amazing how many how many kids people had back then. Very different than now. Not only in, in this family, but in all the other families I was looking at, four or five kids. If you had four kids, that was considered kind of an average family. It was because of the mortality rate, obviously. But yeah, even this guy, Hans Janssen, he had nine kids. He had uh he had he had like no he had eight. He had four from a from one marriage and then he had another four from another marriage. So there was one marriage that took place in I think it was Denmark or Holland. And then there was another uh marriage that took place in New York. So we had he had eight kids. It's pretty cool. I guess. Anyway, 14 generations later, my son is doing a project on this guy. I am the 13th generation. I kind of like the sound of that. 13. Speaking of 13, I, I, I'm not sure what the significance is here, but uh, last night I stayed up again and I watched Winged Beetle for the second time. And uh, if you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend this uh, video which you can find online, and it is available for free on YouTube. It's over an hour. It's an amazing video, actually, and uh, it, it chronicles the insertion of the version of Paul McCartney that we are familiar with now, Fall McCartney, F-A-U-L. And I challenge anyone anyone any beetle fan who is, who just cannot bring themselves to even begin to question the fact that Paul McCartney is not Paul McCartney I challenge him to watch this video and not walk away from the video at the very least trying to understand what they've just seen now they may not believe that this guy is a fake, but I guarantee you their version of reality will be shaken ever so slightly because the amount of information and evidence that's put forth in this thing is almost, almost overwhelming. And they get into all the symbolism and, you know, all the stuff that is hidden in the album covers, backwards masking. And I watched it again late last night. So, you know, it was kind of, in this kind of in-between sleep dream state, man, it is a psychedelic, trippy, and actually in some ways very disturbing video. So I, I, I think you should watch it, you know, in the clarity of day or the light of day so you can actually take it in and use your, your critical senses. I was actually experiencing it as a trip on some level last night. Um, I'm wondering how much I should, I should tell you about it. And cut to the chase. Should I cut to the chase and tell you about it? All right, I will. All right, so the premise of the video is, hold on hold on to your hats. The premise of the video is that Paul McCartney is Aleister Crowley's son. Think about that for a second. So, um, and it, it, didn't, it didn't hit me until I saw it for the second time. I saw it for the second time, and, and it was, oh, wow. This is what's going on here. And then what happens at that point is that not only is he Crowley's son, but he's not just some 
biological offspring. No, he is actually versed in magic. And it is through McCartney where the application of ma the new McCartney, the application of magic, symbolism, uh, esoteric application, it all happens. And it all happens when he shows up. Sergeant Pepper, boom, there we go. There's the symbolic. And, well, there's, some, there's, some, there's other stuff that had gone on. Prior to that, don't get me wrong, because I believe that the Beatles were a MI5 invention, MI5 Tavistock invention. I'm pretty pretty clear about that. But it's with the insertion of the new Paul where it just it takes off like a rocket, a rocket, and uh, it's pretty pretty dark, pretty fascinating. There's a scene where he's on David Letterman. And Letterman's asking him about the whole, uh, you know, the whole dead Paul thing. And he says some very interesting things. Very interesting things. So, uh, Winged Beetle, I highly recommend it. Check it out. And if you, <clears throat> a lot of people think, well, what's, what's it matter? What does it matter that Paul McCartney isn't the real Paul McCartney? Well, it matters a lot, actually. If, you, if the truth be known, it matters a lot, because if that's the case, then Paul McCartney is, and, and, and the Beatles are, an amazing illusion. It is, it is kind of like, it would be the equivalent of the 9-11 of popular culture or popular music. That's what it would be. The only guy left, or the only guys left that have any insight into this right now, are Ringo Starr and George Martin. And it's amazing that George Martin is still alive. I mean, he's no spring chicken. This guy's still kicking it. And then there's Ringo, who you never really see unless he's touring. He never does interviews. Ringo is incredibly private. And I think there's a reason why he's incredibly private. He wants nothing to do with this. Winged Beetle, Paul McCartney. As I mentioned before, today is <clears throat> excuse me. Today is the, uh, the it was uh, the first. Today is the first day. It, it is the inaugural day. It is, we celebrate the beginning of the post office today. 1792, the Postal Service Act was signed into into power by. President George Washington, 1792. Many of you don't know this, but I used to be a postman. I was a postman. And I did it in the early 80s. It was one of my first jobs out of, out of uh, college, to be honest with you. And uh, it was one of the best jobs of my life. And I should never have left that job. However, had I left that job, I not left that job, you and I probably aren't talking. You probably don't know who I am, and you probably don't know my, anything about my life or, you know, who knows how it all goes, but I probably would have been a lot better off financially. Let's put it that way. A lot better off financially. And I'll tell you how I got the job. Since, you know, since jobs are kind of just a theme in my life right now, or at least topically. So I was, uh, this was in 1980, let me see, 1980. Five. It's 1985. I've been back from Fintorn for about eight or nine months. And Fintorn had blown my mind. And I was very into meditation at that time. Meditation and, you know, uh, prayer. It was a very huge part of my life. Every day, meditation. Every night, meditation, meditation, meditation. So I went away, and was, I was without a job at that point in time. I'd been let go from this landscaping job that I'd had. And I went away on a, uh, a weekend trip with a friend of mine, and we went camping. And the camping trip in and of itself was quite unusual. We wound up going to Mendocino County. And again, because I was in this very heightened metaphysical state, uh, a lot of things were happening to me all the time. It was It was exhausting, really, to be honest with you. And we were so we were camping on a beach in Mendocino, and 
um, I was doing astral traveling, a lot of astral traveling then. And um, I had astral traveled from that place and I had found a coven somewhere nearby and they were doing some sort of a ritual and uh, it was creepy and they found me, they saw me and they chased me and I remember coming back into my body uh, and waking up and still in the faint recesses of my consciousness, I could hear the drumming of the ritual, even though it wasn't there around me, <clears throat> excuse me, I could hear it from where it had originated from. So <clears throat> that was one aspect of the, uh, the weekend. It was, it was bizarre that, that and it kind of left me a little shaken to be honest with you. So then, so the next day we hung out, did our thing, whatever. And my friend does he he doesn't, he doesn't really talk a lot. We didn't really talk a lot. A lot of silence. So a lot of things came up for me in this silence about my life. <clears throat> and at the time, I really thought that I was like a, a spiritual poser, to be honest with you. Sort of felt like to me. I felt like I was a spiritual tourist. I mean, even though I'd had this experience and everything, I was questioning my my spiritual commitment at the time. So I go home. It's like, oh, man, what are you doing with your life? What is your life about? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm jobless. I'm staying with my parents, too, by the way, living at my parents' place. And then I, I get up the next morning and I meditate. It's like, okay, God, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm in your hands. I'm in your hands. Just show me. Just show me. I got up, went downstairs. My father was home. You know, at that time we didn't get nobody had mail service. He had to go to the uh, the post office. And, well, you could get mail service. Well, not really. Well, I guess you did, but you could also have a post office box. So we had a post office box, and it was in the town next to ours, but it wasn't that far away, maybe about half a mile. So we drove down there, and we're going to get our mail. And there's a sign on the front door of the post office. It's a Monday. And the sign was for a, it was a job at the post office, hiring a rural route relief carrier. And I didn't know what it was, but I knew that I had to apply for that job. So I did. I went in. I got the application. I applied. And I was hired like that. Only job in the postal service where you did not have to join the union and you did not have to take a test. It was a rural route relief carrier. So there's a difference between a regular postal worker and a rural route carrier. Since this was on the coast, it was, it was considered a rural route, which meant that you drive your own car, you get a stipend for the car for repairs and all that stuff, and you get a little bit of money each day for gas, and you get a salary. And the woman who I was replacing – was on maternity leave. Well, she never came back. So that was my job to, to lose. And I and I stayed at it for a little over a year and a half, and I, I saved up a lot of money. It was, it was a very cool job, super cool job. I got up at, you know, 6 in the morning. Um, I was down at the at the uh, station, the office, the, the, post, the post office uh, at by, by 7. I'd sort through all my mail, stack it all up stick it in my car. I'd be out the door by about nine o'clock in the morning and then, you know, nine thirty, and then I would just do my route. And it was on the coast. It was beautiful. Some days were, were lovely. Lunchtime, I'd get a sandwich. I'd park my car overlooking the ocean. I'd have my, my sandwich. I'd listen to the radio. I'd listen to KPFA all the time. Listen to great programming. I'd be done by about three 30 I take my dog, hit the beach, go running. It's great. It's a great life. Absolutely great life. And then I wound up getting involved with somebody and got my world all twisted around and wound up leaving the job. Some bad relationship. Pisces. Bane of my existence. No, I take that back. My son's a Pisces. How can I say that? Anyway, there you go. My life as a as a mail carrier. I wish I'd had uh, some very interesting stories to tell you. Unfortunately, I don't. 
I only remember that it was a very civil job, very cordial job. People treated me well. I got a great tips at Christmas time. Loved it. Cookies, money, alcohol, you name it, I got it. And that was good. I was a good mail carrier. I was the guy that, that would actually, you know, if somebody wanted stamps, they put money in their mailbox, I'd get the stamps, I'd bring them out the next day. I mean, I was a full-service mail carrier, let me tell you. So today, the Postal Service, we salute you. Let's see, what else do we have here? <clears throat> uh, Swan Lake premiered today, back in 1877. The Mercury Program, John Glenn becomes the first American to orbit the Earth today, in 1962. Today is that day. He is the first American that we know of to do that, right? The first American that we know of. Carolyn Mickelson became the first woman to set foot in Antarctica. This is in 1935. Carolyn Mickelson. Uh, Today, the Congress of the United States approves the construction of the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge by the state of California, which was closed today, this last weekend, for three days because of major repairs they're doing or major adjustments they're doing to the new part of the bridge, which was built by Chinese labor, by the way. Uh, let's see, today, 1933, the Congress of the United States proposes the 21st Amendment to the United States Constitution that will end prohibition in the United States. Prohibition, one of the worst things that happened to this country, by the way, along with the Depression. Because what happened in prohibition? Well, what happened in prohibition is that the gangster class made a shitload of illegal money. That's what they did. They eliminated their competition, like they always do, and they made a shitload of money. And you look at the people that made money during that time, a lot of the same people are in power to this day. One of the big movers and shakers, the money makers during Prohibition work was the Bronfman family, who brought in whiskey from Canada. That was their thing, Canadian whiskey, the Bronfmans. And what are the Bronfmans doing right now? Well, they're they're running most of, of American media. I still believe that they own Seagram's, which is their legal conduit for selling booze. And the latest generation of the Bronfman family, Benjamin Bronfman, is married to MIA. Nothing will happen to MIA, trust me, with her little middle finger moment during the Super Bowl ritual. Nothing will happen to her. She is untouchable. So prohibition, <clears throat> which theoretically was set up as part of this, this piece that would allow women the right to vote as well, it just made a bunch of a, a large group of people a lot of money because, again, they eliminated the competition. The Kennedys made a ton of money during that time as well. They were getting rum from South America from their good friend, Aristotle Onassis, who was also bringing opium up from South America as well. That's how Onassis made his money. It wasn't just the ships. It was what was on the ships. So the connection between Onassis and the Kennedys goes way back, way back to the, to the 30s. That's where, that's where it takes place. What else do we have here today? Anything? Uh, uh, Unibomber exploded a bomb at a computer store in Salt Lake City. That was today, back in 1987. An IRA bomb. Oh, hold on. Let me go back. Let me go back. Just the, the, the prohibition thing, and it, it ran through my head as I was processing, processing it. Uh, it's a very Neptunian thing. It's a very Piscean thing, don't you think? It's very Piscean that prohibition would end during the, the, the first degrees of Pisces. Fascinating. 
truly fascinating that would take place during that time, whether it was chosen or whether it was just kind of one of these meta astrological events. The timing is, is noteworthy. Let's see what else do we have here. Uh, the U-bomber. Uh, an IRA bomb destroys a section of the British Army barracks in Turnhill, England. What else do we have? Um, speaking of MIA, back in 2009, two Tamil Tiger aircraft packed with C-4 explosives and route to National Air Force Headquarters are shot down by the Sri Lankan military for reaching their target in a kamikaze style. So bombing, there's a big there's a big bombing theme here for this day, huh? We've got the IRA bomb, we've got the the Unabomber bomb, we've got the Tamil Tigers who are going to bomb uh with their planes. There's another there's a there's a lot of oh uh today is the uh, the unfortunate anniversary of the fire in West Warwick, Rhode Island, where Great White were playing. This is in 2003. It killed over 100 people in the club that they were playing at. Can you believe that? It killed over 100. Could you, can you imagine being in that club and that fire goes off? Great White. Kind of a a tricky day today, huh? In terms of uh, in terms of unusual events. How about birthdays? What kind of birthdays do we have today? Anybody of interest? Uh, Gloria Vanderbilt. Do you know who Gloria Vanderbilt's son is? Anderson Cooper. Yep. Anderson Cooper. That's her son. Gloria Vanderbilt, of course, her longtime companion is Bobby Short. Or was Bobby Short, the singer, piano player. So Bobby Short was Anderson Cooper's pretty much his stepdad. And most people know that Anderson Cooper, by the way, is a CIA asset. If you don't know it, wake up. There's plenty of information out there. Uh, let's see. Robert Altman was born today as well. The enigmatic American filmmaker, Robert Altman. Uh, you should watch Nashville at some point. If you are into movies that look at media and begin to pull the covers back, Nashville is one of those movies. It looks at the music scene, the country music scene, and there is kind of an undercurrent of alter programming in that movie. I'd, uh, I'd check it out. Ibrahim Ferrer, the wonderful, wonderful uh, musician who uh, left an indelible mark on many people in the documentary, The Point of Vista Social Club. It was his birthday today. He passed away in 2005. Sidney Poitier, his birthday is today. Great actor, Sidney Poitier. Let's see who else we have. Um couple of interesting auto racing birthdays. Both Roger Penske and Bobby Unser share this birthday. I would consider them time twins. Penske has made a huge amount of money with his moving companies, obviously. Uh, let's see, who else? Buffy St. Marie. I'm sure there are a lot of Buffy St. Marie fans that are listening today. To this show, her birthday is today. Magic is afoot. It's one of her lines. Who else? Uh, Sandy Duncan. Remember her? Today's her birthday. Uh, the lovely Jennifer O'Neill. The not so lovely Ivana Trump. Her birthday is today. Gordon Brown, his birthday. Randy California, the guitarist for Spirit, the band Spirit, his birthday is today. Uh, Randy California is an interesting guy. He he was uh, tutored by Jimi Hendrix, and Hendrix gave him the name Randy California. 
and he, he was in the band Spirit. And Ed uh, Cassidy, <coughs> who was the drummer of the band, was his stepfather. I'm a big Spirit fan. I like what they did. His birthday is today. Well, Patty Hearst. It's Patty Hearst's birthday. Now, there's a weird story, huh? Patty Hearst. Talk about Alter. <laughs> I used to work at a uh, Walgreens in uh, Belmont, and Patty Hearst would come in and shop. Who was her, uh, her her husband, Bernard Shaw? Who was her her security guy? She married her security guy. People would say, Patty Hearst, Patty Hearst is here, Patty Hearst is here. So I used to, I used to, in fact, I think I might have even checked Patty Hearst out at the checkout stand one day. So there we go, Patty Hearst's birthday. And a strange, strange story, huh? SLA. Symbionese Liberation Army. Talk about an MK Ultra front. Here we go. Charles Barkley, his birthday today. Uh, Ian Brown, one of my favorite singers. Complete and utter asshole, but uh, a great talent. His birthday is today. And I believe it's also the birthday of Kurt Cobain. Yes, it is indeed. There it is. Kurt Cobain and Ian Brown, their birthdays are today. Cindy Crawford, her birthday is today. Um, somebody by the name of Vaginal Davis. What a lovely name. American drag queen and performance artist. Their birthday is today. And there's a bunch of other people, some of which you may not find that interesting. And, okay, here we go. Birthday watch. A lot of them. We're at zero degrees. Are we in zero degrees Pisces today? I think we are. Shall we uh, Shall we go online and check that out? Let's just do a quick perusal of the stars, shall we? Since this is what I do, it's part of my living. By the way, I want to thank everybody that, uh, that listened to my uh, mini, mini rant or, or, the, or imploring you to take to avail yourself of my services and get a reading. I had a couple of readings come out of that, so that's good. I want to thank you for that because certainly it is a great uh, assistance and service to me, and I in turn will be of great assistance and service to you. So today we have the sun at one degree Pisces, and we're coming up here on a uh, sun moon conjunction. New moon, I believe, happens what on. Uh, Tomorrow, the end of tomorrow. So, of new moon, end of tomorrow, beginning of Wednesday. So, the moon sun conjunction will be interesting, interesting conjunction for sure, because um, the moon will be uh, lining up with Chiron. The sun will be lined up with Chiron. So, we'll have a we'll have a, a stellium in uh, in uh, Pisces. Sun, moon. We'll have more than a stellium. Boy, we'll have uh, it's going to be Pisces overload here pretty soon. So, we're going to have sun, moon, Mercury. Neptune and Chiron, five planets of Pisces. Whoa. That's a lot of fish. I'm going to have to do a post on that, see if I can swim through that. We've been posting a lot about Pisces lately. So we're going to have five planets of Pisces. Well, what do you, you know, what do you do with an early Pisces sun right now? Uh, and coming up on the, so the the, Pisces, the the sun moon conjunction is going to be very interesting, especially in light of the conjunctions with Chiron and um, very early degrees of Neptune. I tell you, if there's any day where you want to watch your thoughts and your feelings, it's going to be that day. You want to be really, really conscious of what you're um, taking in. You don't want to take in garbage. Like if you can. We're talking Wednesday. That's really the big day is Wednesday. If you can, take a big time out. Go go meditate. Go to the go to the go to the temple. Go to the spa. Go wherever it is you go, but but you take take in nothing but but positive loving influence in your life. Don't Take in any garbage, any noise. And I promise I'm going to write something very positive on my, my blog. So if you do decide to come to my blog, 
you will be bombarded with a lot of heavy, dark information. I will go with the flow, and I will give you truth and beauty on that day. But seriously, you need to be very careful. I mean, mean, if we're taking this astrological stuff seriously, then that's a day that we need to just chill out and do our best to reach into the um, most nurturing and profound aspects of our being. Well, what's interesting, now that I think about it, is that on Wednesday, <clears throat> I'm going to have a, a rare guest on the uh, the astrological show. Should be very interesting. Uh, her name is Sister Myra, and I discovered her through one of my uh, readers, and she was she was ecstatic about the work that this woman had done with the Super Bowl ritual, the Madonna Super Bowl ritual, and apparently she's done Super Bowl rituals or she's done work on them for the last 10 Super Bowls. And I went and I listened to a, a blog talk show that she was on, and I, I found her to be really interesting. She's from Baltimore, and uh, she's she's really sharp. She knows her astrology. She knows her symbolism. And she comes at this from the perspective of a uh, black woman. And she'll, she's got some very keen and penetrating insight into the Super Bowl ritual from the experience of a black woman. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how it dovetails with what happened with Whitney Houston. And I found out some details, by the way, (coughs) about this whole Whitney Houston thing over the weekend that were really shocking. I mean, shocking. (coughs) Excuse me. Um, Gloria uh, Savage, who some of you know through the chat room and through other stuff, Gloria sent me a link to this woman who did a post. Her name, her name is Spirit Diva, and she's very into the whole MK thing. She, she has different opinions about it, but she's very dialed into it. So she sent me her post on this. Maybe I'll try to get her on at some point, too. Um, she had these pictures up on her post, and they were having, and I was not aware of this, because you know, a lot of the details now are starting to surface after the fact. But they were having a uh, an award ceremony to Clive Davis the night before the Grammys. This was everybody was loving Clive Davis, and they announced that Whitney Houston had died during that party. And they had a, and they actually threw up a picture of her on this large screen in in a crucifixion pose, and I'm like I'm, I'm I mean I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and then they just simply went on and fucking partied. I couldn't believe it. I mean it was insane. And of course the whole idea here was to traumatize everybody in the room until that people in the room know that they could be next right blew my mind when I saw that and then there's a picture of um, this young woman Ciara she's a singer Ciara Ciara C-I-A-R-A she came up right around the same time as Rihanna but didn't, apparently she wasn't tapped to be the next whatever Rihanna was. Ciara is at this uh, table. She's sitting with Gail King and uh, Serena Williams. She gets up. This is during the party. This is, you know, I'm not sure whether it's when they announce that Whitney died or I'm not sure at what point it takes place, but she gets up. And she stands up and she does the double Baphomet, which is the you know the first finger and the pinky finger, and she's like flashing the double both hands. I'm like, what? What is what is up with that? I mean, man, I tell you, man, Hollywood is sick, 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 sick. 
666. That's what Hollywood is. Anyway, we're going to be on the air with uh, Sister Myra on Wednesday with all this Neptunian stuff. We're, we're I guess we're going to try to swim through uh, the, uh, the the Neptunian currents on Wednesday with the show. That should be interesting for sure. She's cool. She's a extremely, extremely strong lady and a very, very clear, keen insight. And we'll get into that on Wednesday. And then on Friday, I'm going to have uh, Constance Dambion. Constance is an old friend. Uh, she used to live here in the Bay Area. She's down in L.A. now. And she's uh, she's an interesting person. She's hip to a lot of the stuff that we talk about here on the show or I talk about on my blog. She's a little a little bit lighter than me, I have to say. I, mean, I, remember, I remember kind of getting into an argument with, Con- with Connie back in uh, 2008, 2009, when Obama just got elected. And I was, I was actually not happy. And I was presenting her with all this stuff. She didn't want to hear it. But, of course, just like most of the people who – most of his base, they're starting to hear it now. and They still don't really want to hear it, but they can't avoid it. I, I, you know, we had a bit of a falling out, but, you know, time heals these things. And, you know, she's come back around. And uh, she's very interesting. Her uh, record, Novus Magnificat, one of the uh, largest selling New Age records of all time. We'll talk about that record and her career and her views on the universe. She's lovely. She's charming. We'll get a kick out of her in a big way. And then in the second hour, I'll have John Friedlander, who is the psychic's psychic, Richard Grossinger, my good friend from North Atlantic Books, claims that John is the best psychic living on the planet. So we're going to talk to John. And the thing with John is he's also very spiritual, and we'll, and we'll get into – some of his um, where, where, where psychic research and spirituality dovetail. It should be a very interesting show, both hours of the show. I just put a new post up on my site about Jeremy Lin. I couldn't help it. I've got to ride the Lin wave. You know, I can't. It's like, I, I, you know, I can't. I guess, you know, bang bang the dark drum all the time. But the Jeremy Lin thing is just fascinating. It is really, from a cultural perspective, it is really fascinating. I got to tell you. First of all, from a basketball perspective, nobody's ever done this before. I mean, nobody, nobody. Basketball, unlike baseball and football, is a very, very different sport, and I'll tell you why. <clears throat> because the scouting of talent in basketball starts in junior high school. junior high school, and they have these AAU teams, and they are, they're pretty corrupt, by the way, and there's also, you haven't read about it yet, but you will, there's, there's going to, you'll, you'll read about the dark underbelly of what goes on with coaches and young boys in basketball, it's coming, trust me, it is coming, but anyway, these AAU teams are very popular, they get, the kids get Sneakers, they get all this free stuff. They're treated as entitled little potentates because they can play. A, they can put a ball through a hoop. And uh, seven times out of ten, those kids are black because the there's no there's no denying that the level of athletic ability is just different between young black males. And young males are just about any other race. I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. I'm not being racist. That there's, I mean, I played sports. It's a given. So what happens is, is that the athletic ability is rewarded. And the, these kids are tracked. They're tracked through junior high, through high school. And if they can play, trust me, they're being recruited in junior high by colleges. And then they get into high school and they do a little recruiting here, a little recruiting there. And everybody is trying their best to find these talents so that they can up the profile of their program, win games, make more money, get more endorsement deals. It's all in the backs of these young kids. So trust me, they these kids play under a microscope. If you have talent and you can play, the word gets out and it does not take long for people to figure that out. And they are nurtured accordingly. 
And by the time you get to the pros, two things happen. You either blow up the way you're supposed to blow up or you fail miserably based on, uh, you know, expectations that are off the charts. And that happens. Case in point, kid like O.J. Mayo. O.J. Mayo was recruited and, and purport, and he was, O.J. Mayo was going to be the next Michael Jordan when he was in high school. Huge, huge deal about him going to USC. And, I mean, it was a big deal because he had so much hype around him in high school. He played one season at USC. He was a good player. You know, he wasn't, I mean, he, he was very good for the Pac, Pac-12 or Pac-10, whatever it was at the time. But he's not, he, he wasn't a superstar in the pros. Now he's in the pros. He's a sixth man, meaning he comes off the bench. He's a good player, but he's not, he's not a guy that's going to carry the team. And yet in high school, I mean, the hyper on O.J. Mayo was just off the freaking charts. And, of course, he, he O.J. Mayo is one of the reasons why USC's basketball program, their coach, Kevin O'Neill, got in big trouble because they paid him to play there. Everybody knows that. So when you see this with these players under these microscopes, because everybody wants a piece of them, and then you see a guy like Jeremy Lin who just flies under the radar the whole time. Maybe it's because of his race. Maybe it's because these other kids are just creating more noise. And then he gets to, and he gets a chance, and he explodes the way he's exploding. That doesn't happen in pro basketball. This is what I'm trying to tell you. It just does not happen. It does not happen. Jeremy Lin is a one in a million story for pro basketball. It might happen in pro baseball. It might. You could have guys that are drafted in the 73rd round. Nobody gives them a chance. And the next thing you know, they come out of nowhere and they're just dominating. Fernando Valenzuela, Mark Fidrich. These things do happen in baseball. Occasionally, they will happen in football. Um, Jeff Garcia, who played for the San Francisco 49ers, he was one of those guys. He played in the Canadian League. Nobody gave him a rat's ass you know, chance to, to, to you know, play at a high level. He came in. He was, he was exceptional. It does happen from time to time in pro football, not in pro basketball. So when you look at it from, those term, from, those, from that perspective, it's really interesting, right? The other perspective is, is that, uh, again, I mean, he is, he's a good kid. I mean, he's a really good kid. And I've seen his impact on that team. And at the end of the game, the Knicks were all in a circle, and they were all at midcourt, and they were just – they just won the game yesterday. And they were just in this kind of, you know, revelatory group, synergistic – moment and it was uh, it was kind of profound i got to tell you and what jeremy lynn stands for is this whole concept of synergy that the whole are is greater than the parts and he keeps talking about that he keeps talking about how it's my teammates how it's this how it's that you know he's very tim tebow like in that regard and again he's a christian and what what I what I'm witnessing and what we're witnessing is something good in the world. Okay, it is something good. Here, here's here's somebody who has the the right perspective and the right attitude, and not only that, but they're successful and they're emanating, and I mean emanating, a dynamism that is changing people's lives in a very powerful way. This is not dark. This is not ironic. This is none of that. This is purely somebody who, given a chance, is excelling, is making people better around him, and might even be making um, conditions better around him. And it's through a purity of intent that this is taking place, a purity of intent. Pay attention to this. It's important. It's important. Don't dismiss it as being some kind of sports hype. It's not. There's a cosmic lesson going on here because we have enough noise and enough bullshit in our, in our uh, universe, on this planet, to really, really 
torpedo us. You know, I wrote about this the other day on my website about, you know, all this crap coming out of, you know, Indonesia and Thailand and India about the, the Iranians going after diplomats, Israeli diplomats. I mean, it is the fog of war. It's the hype of war. It's the same thing that was going on pre-Iraq. pre, pre, uh, pre -Iraq. It's the same kind of noise. And Jeremy Lin is not that. He's not that. He's not that. And I'm not saying Jeremy Lin is a savior or anything, but what I'm what I'm sharing with you is is that this is an important cultural meta moment. Pay attention to it because it is it is teaching us something in a very big way. And I wrote a post on on Lin last night on my site and uh, found that he's uh, his Pluto is right on his ascendant at 10 degrees. Sun in the tenth house makes total sense. Or I'm a little concerned about uh, this game he's got with Boston, where uh, the Cancer Moon everything took off for him when the Moon was in Cancer and it touched his Chiron uh, in the eighth house. That's when this whole cycle started, and it's coming back again. So I'm a little concerned about that, um, and that's on the website as well. You can find out more about that. Well, it's, I've got nine minutes left, and I managed to talk pretty much through the the, uh, the bulk of the show. Um, all right, real quick story, and then um, I'm uh, going to transi transition out of here. So Saturday, I'm with my kid, and we're at uh, we're at this thing called Boomers, and it's like a family fun center. It's me and him and, and my mother. And we're out playing mini golf. Crowded. So everybody decided that they were going to go out and play mini golf or do whatever they do at Boomers. I wish I had stock in Boomers that day, by the way. So we play mini golf, play through our holes, and they have a, a they have go karts there. So I just my kid loves go karts, so I decided to take them on the go karts. We get in line, and there there are there are two go karts. There's a single for single riders, and then the double go kart for people that have kids. And they want the kid to go for a ride in the go kart, but the kids aren't big enough to ride on their own. So there's there's two lines. There's two sets of carts. There's carts on the track, and there's carts being loaded up with with drivers. So they're cycling so in and out, in and out, in and out. It's a pretty good system. We're in line, and I swear to God, all these people are just they're, they've got they've got their their a couple of people in line, and you know next thing I know, you know, four other people are joining them in line, and it's driving me nuts. It's driving me nuts. You know, ahead of me, two people, you know, a couple of people ahead of me, and it's like, what, you know, will we ever get there? You know, to the front of the line, and I'm trying to think. I'm thinking about this, like, well, what do I do? Because number one. I don't want to wait either, to be honest with you. But but I'm you know I'm taking my licks in line like everybody else because I don't know anybody in the front of the line. So what you know what do I do? Do I say something? And if I do say something, what what, what grounds or basis do I have anything to say about? No. Because if because if it was me, let's say for instance with my kid, and let's say his cousin showed up and wanted to ride with us, I'd let him in because you know people want to ride together, right? That's what they want to do. But the difference is, is that it would probably be just his cousin and not like five other people. You know, I mean, there's, there's, it was, they're, they're kind of taking advantage of this good natured human act to allow somebody to ride with their group. It was like a strategy. It's like, we'll hold the line. You go play games. When the time comes, I'll text you and you bring everybody else up here. I mean, that's kind of what it was like bothering me so we get to the front of the line and there was this group of girls who had uh gone on so when we first got in the line this group of 14 18 girls were going to be behind us but i watched them and they they basically went near the front of the line that was when i first noticed that this was happening so we're getting to the front of the line we're getting ready to go on and that group of teen girls wound up finishing their race. They got off their carts, they walked back around, and apparently their mother was right behind me. 
and they hopped over the rails and they're ready to go back in line again. And I watched this. <clears throat> I'm like, are you kidding me? I mean, they just got off the race and now they're going to get right back on again. And there's a group of people behind them and they didn't say anything, but I did. I said, come on, that's not fair to the people behind you. So they've been waiting here for a long time and you just got off the race and you're just going to jump in front of them? So then the mother put up a, a shit fit. So well, what about all the other people? How come you're not hard on them? And I said, well, because, you know, you just got off, they just got off the race. I didn't see them just get off the race. And guess what they did? She got out of line. They got out of line. They went to the back of the line. You know why they did that? Because they knew they were wrong. That's why. They knew they were wrong. And this goes back to the the line by William Blake, which is, speak your mind and the base man shall avoid you. Don't ever forget that. Speak your mind and the base man shall avoid you. All right, that's it. I'll leave you with that bit of wisdom from one of my favorite Sagittarians. I hope you enjoy this very oceanic early degree of Pisces. And you know the drill. Use your head to discern what's real, your heart to say what what's possible. I'm Robert Phoenix. You've been listening to the Monday Mashup. And I'll be back on Wednesday with Sister Myra. Don't miss this show. It's going to be a very, very, very good show. Let's play Great Big Water by Alma Desnuda. Desnuda. Uh, and this is, uh, this is sort of the first degree of Pisces, Great Big Water. I'll see you on Wednesday. message.
why we drop our funky riff. Listen to this message while we drop our funky riffs. 